Chapter Eleven of the Life Story of a Black Bear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox Four. The Life Story of a Black Bear by Harry Perry Robinson. Chapter Eleven the troubles of a father every young cub i imagine gets into about the same amount of trouble and causes about the same worry and anxiety to his parents i know that little waka took the earliest possible opportunity of getting himself stuck full of porcupine quills and i do not suppose he made any more fuss when his mother pulled them out than I had done under similar circumstances five summers before. He nearly drowned himself by tumbling into the swiftest part of the stream that he could find, and when I laughed at him, shivering and whining, while his mother alternately licked and cuffed him on the head, I could not help thinking of my own misery when I went downhill into the snow. As I looked at him, so preposterously small and fluffy and brown, it was, as I said at the beginning, hard to believe that I was ever quite like that. But I recognized myself in things that he did fifty times a day. Kawa, too, was exactly like the other little Kawa, her aunt who was dead. Waka would be sitting looking into the air at nothing, as cubs do, when she would steal up behind him and make a sudden grab at his hind foot. I could remember just how it felt when her teeth caught hold, and he would roll over on his side, squealing, and smack her head until she let go. In a few minutes they were perfectly good friends again, hunting squirrels up the trees, and standing down below with open mouths, waiting for them to drop in. I showed them how to play at pulling each other down the hill, and often of an afternoon I would sit with my own back against the tree and invite them to pull me down. Then it was just as it used to be. Waka came at me on one side, slowly and doggedly, almost in silence, but intensely in earnest, while on the other side Kawa rushed on me like a little whirlwind yapping and snarling and scuffling all over me with her mouth wide open to grab anything that was within reach the same ferocious reckless little spitfire as i had known years ago they were good children i think at all events woofer and i were very proud of them and she used to spend an astonishing amount of time licking them and combing them and smacking their little woolly heads. Then we began to take them out and teach them how to find food, and what food to eat, that the easiest way to get at a lily bulb is not to scrabble at it with both paws straight down, but to scoop it out with one good scrape from the side, how to wipe off the top of an anthill at one smooth stroke, how to distinguish the wild onion by its smell, and what the young shoots of the white kamas look like. They soon learned not to pass any fair-sized stone without turning it over to look for the insects beneath, and also that it is useless to go on turning the same stone over and over again to keep looking at the other side. Every fallen log had to be carefully inspected, the bark ripped off where it was rotten to get at the beetles and grubs and woodlice underneath, and, if it were not too heavy, the log itself should be rolled over. We taught them that, in approaching a log or large stone, one should always sniff well first to see if there is a mouse or chipmunk underneath, and, if there be fresh scent, turn it over with one paw while holding the other ready to strike. Mice bothered them dreadfully at first, dodging and zigzagging round their hind legs and keeping them hopping in the air 
while they grabbed wildly at the little thing that was never where it ought to be when the paw came down to squash it. I shall never forget the first time that Waka found a chipmunk by himself. He lifted a stone very cautiously, with his nose much too close to it, apparently expecting the chipmunk to run into his mouth, which it did not do. But as soon as the stone was lifted an inch, it was out, and on to Waka's nose, and over his head, down the middle of his back, and off into the wood. Waka really never saw it at all, and was spinning round and round, trying to get at the middle of his own back after the chipmunk was a hundred yards away. We took the cubs down to the stream and showed them how to root along the edges among the grass for weeds, for frogs and snails, and water beetles and things. And when the trout came upstream, we caught some for them and showed them how to do it. But fishing is a thing that needs too much patience to commend itself to cubs. Waka did not have any adventure with a puma, but he had one experience which might have been even more serious. He had wandered away from his mother and myself, just as he had been told hundreds of times not to do, when suddenly there was a noise of a scuffle from his direction, and he was screaming with all his might. I was there in a moment, with his mother close behind me, and saw two huge grey wolves which had already rolled him over, and in another instant would have done for him. We charged them, but they were gone before we reached the spot, and beyond a bad shaking and one scar on his shoulder, Waka was none the worse. He was a thoroughly frightened cub, however, and it would have taken a great deal of persuasion to make him leave his mother's side for the rest of that day. Indeed, it was necessary to be careful for more than that day, because the wolves hung around us, hoping still to catch either him or Kawa alone where they could make away with them. I dislike wolves immensely. In spite of their size and the strength of their jaws, they are cowardly animals, and one wolf will never attack even a much smaller beast than himself alone if he can get another to help him. Bears are not like that. We want to have our fighting to ourselves. We would much rather have any other bear that is near stand and look on instead of coming to help us, unless, of course, it is a case of husband and wife and one or other is overmatched. What we do, we do in the open and prefer that people should understand our intentions clearly and take us just as we are. A wolf is exactly the opposite. He never does anything openly that he can do in secret. He likes to keep out of sight and hunt by stealth, owing what he gets to his cunning and to superior numbers rather than to his own individual fighting spirit. We recognize that wolves know many things that we do not, though some of them are things that we would not want to know. And they think us fools, but they keep out of our way. There have indeed, I believe, been cases where a number of wolves together have succeeded in killing a bear, not in fair fight, but by dogging and following him for days, preventing his either eating or sleeping, until, from sheer exhaustion, he has been unable to resist them when they have attacked him in force and pulled him down. This, however, could not happen in the mountains. The wolves are only there in the summer, and then they run in couples, or alone, or at most in families of two old ones and the cubs together. In the autumn they go down to the foothills and the plains, and then it is only in hard weather that they collect in packs. At that time the bears are usually in their winter dens, and all the wolves that were ever born could never get a bear out of his den, where they can reach him only in front. In this case, the wolves which had attacked Waka seldom showed themselves, but that they were constantly near us and watching us, we knew. With all their cunning, 
they could not help getting between us and the wind once in a while and sometimes when they were a little distance away we could hear them quarrelling between themselves over some small animal they had killed or some scrap of food they had found in the forest it is not pleasant being shadowed whether it is your child or yourself that is being hunted and we had to be extremely cautious not to let either kawa or waka out of our sight nor was it always easy in spite of his recent fright to keep the latter under restraint for he was an independent self-reliant youngster of inexhaustible inquisitiveness one day when we knew the wolves were following us and we were keeping waka well in hand we met a family of elk two parents and quite a young fawn and waka must needs go and try to find out all about the fawn he meant no harm whatever and had no idea that there was any danger he only thought that the fawn would be a nice thing to play with and before we could stop him he had trotted straight up to it elk are jealous animals and like all deer in spite of their timidity will fight to protect their young and with his tremendous antlers and great strength a big stag is a person to be let alone waka knew nothing about all this and went straight towards the fawn in the friendliest and most confiding way fortunately the stag was some yards away and we were able to put waka on his guard in time but it was a narrow escape and i do not think the stag's antler missed his tail by half an inch woofer jumped in the stag's way and for a minute it looked as if there would be a fight of course it would have ended in our killing the stag and probably also his wife and the fawn as well but one or the other of us would have been likely to have had the end of an antler through the ribs before the fight was over the stag showed not the slightest intention of running away though he must have known perfectly well that the odds were hopelessly against him but he stood facing woofer with his head down snorting and pawing the ground and telling her to come on she was so angry at the attack on waka that for a moment she was inclined to do it but i spoke to her and she cooled down and we moved away leaving the stag still pawing the ground and shaking his head in possession of the field i have already said that we had had warning that the wolves were hanging about us that day and we had not gone far after the meeting with the elk before we heard that some sort of trouble was in progress behind it was not difficult to guess what it was the snarling and yapping of the wolves the breaking of branches and the clashing of the elk's antlers told the story the wolves following us had made up their minds that the fawn would be easier prey and better eating than a bear cub and the stag we knew was doing his best to defend his young we were very much inclined to go down and help the stag but we stood and listened and suddenly the noise stopped the silence that ensued was too much for our curiosity and back we went as we came near we knew that the fight could not be altogether over for there was still a sound of snarling and the angry stamping of a stag and the sight that at last met our eyes was one that it did us good to see there was a wide circular open space in which every living thing had been trampled down and the ground was all scored and furrowed with the mark of hoof and antler and in the middle stood the stag erect and defiant before him on the ground lay the body of the he-wolf covered with blood and stamped almost beyond recognition there was blood his own blood on the stag's shoulder and blood on his horns which was not his own at the edge of the circle lying down and panting lay the she-wolf sulky and baffled and evidently with no mind to go on with the combat alone though the stag challenged her to come on 
when he saw us the stag perhaps thought that we were new enemies come to take up the cause of the remaining wolf for he signalled to his wife who with the fawn was standing behind him and they began to move slowly away the deer and fawn going first and the stag following moving backwards and keeping his antlers always towards the enemy till they had passed out of the circle of cleared space into the trees the she-wolf lay there till they had passed turning sulkily to snarl at us once in a while and then as we stood still and showed no sign of approaching or attacking her she got up and walked over to the dead body of her husband and began turning it over with her nose next she commenced to lick him and then taking the throat in her mouth deliberately began to bite into it growling and snarling she crouched over the body and we left her to her horrid meal it was a relief to know that we at least would be no more troubled by her or her husband on the whole life went very peaceably with us as it had done with my parents when kawa and i were cubs in the days before man came and before the forest fire drove us into his arms this year we saw no sign of man we had no wish to do so and took care not to go in any direction where we thought we were likely to meet him once in a midsummer we saw the sky to the north of us red for two or three nights with flames in the distance and i wondered for a while whether history was going to repeat itself but the wind blew steadily from the southwest and the fire did not come within many miles of us it must i guessed be somewhere in the neighborhood of the former fire and of course it is where man is that forest fires are frequent for man is the only animal that makes fire for himself and it is from his fires that the flames spread to the woods sometimes in very dry seasons the woods ignite of themselves but that is rare of course as the summer grew we moved about and wandered abroad as in other years keeping in the neighborhood of the streams sheltering during the heat of the day and roaming over the mountains in the sweet cool air of the night and morning we always kept together though of course the little ones clung to their mother more than to me i was a kind father to them i think and i believe they liked and admired me as much as young cubs ought to like and admire their father but as is always the case in families like ours while occasionally one of them generally kawa would wander away from the others with me usually woofa and the youngsters kept close together while i moved about alone though within calling distance in case i should be needed sometimes the father bear leaves the family altogether during the early summer months and either goes alone or joins other he bears that are solitary like himself but it is better for the family to stay together besides woofer and i suited each other admirably as hunting companions and i'm not ashamed to confess that i was fond of my children i began to realize what an anxiety i must have been to my own parents for one or the other of the cubs was always getting into trouble they were sitting one day watching woofer and myself trying to turn over a big log we had warned them again and again not to stand below a log downhill when we were moving it but of course kawa had paid no attention and as that was the best place from which to watch the operation down she sat and contentedly awaited results after two or three efforts we felt the log begin to move and then with one heave together we got it started and it rolled straight down on kawa we had been too busy to notice where she was till we heard her squeal it might very easily have killed her and as it was her hind leg was firmly caught 
with the whole weight of the great log resting on it. Her mother boxed her ears while I managed to move the log enough to set her free, but her foot was badly crushed, and she limped more or less for the rest of the summer. On another occasion, Waka put his head into a slit in a hollow tree to look for honey, and could not get it out again. I have heard of bears being killed in that way, when the hole is some distance from the ground. The opening will probably be narrower towards the bottom than it is in the middle, and when a bear climbs up to the hole, of course he puts his head in at the widest part. Perhaps he slips, and his neck slides down to where the slit is narrower. If he loses his hold altogether, his whole weight comes down on his neck, and he breaks it. And even if that does not happen, he may not be able to raise himself and force his neck up to the wider opening again, but has to hang there, caught in a trap, until he dies. In this case, Waka's feet were on the ground, as the hole was quite low down, so there was no danger of his being hanged. But he was so frightened when he found that he could not pull his head out again, that it is quite possible that, if he had been alone, he would never have succeeded in getting loose. But his mother smacked him until he lifted his head a little to where the hole was an inch or so wider, and he was able to pull out. But there was not much hair left on the back of his ears by the time he was free. With all the trouble that they gave us, however, and though I would not have let them know it for worlds, and always made a point of noticing their existence as little as possible, I was proud of my children. Waka especially gave promise of growing into a splendid bear, while Kawa was the very image of her mother, even down to the little white streak on her chest, though that did not appear until she got her second year's coat. They were good, straightforward, rollicking youngsters who got all the pleasure out of life that there was to be got, and enjoyed amazingly everything that was good to eat. I shall never forget the first time that we introduced them to a berry patch, and their first wild raspberries drove them nearly crazy. They would not go to sleep all next day, though it was blazing hot, but sat up while we slept, and whenever we woke, begged to be taken to look for more raspberries. When winter approached, we returned to the place where we had hibernated the previous year. Woofer hollowed out her den to twice its former size, so as to hold herself and both the cubs, and I took my old quarters close by. Winter came slowly, and after all our preparations were made, we were able to be about for a long time, during which we did nothing but eat and sleep, and gather strength and fatness for the long fast that was coming. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of The Life Story of a Black Bear》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox Four. The Life Story of a Black Bear by Harry Perry Robinson. Chapter Twelve. Wiping out old scores. I have said more than once that both Woofer and I had made up our minds that we never wished to see man again. Looking back now, it is hard to tell what made us depart from that determination. Indeed, I am not sure that there was any particular moment at which we did definitely change our minds and decide to go into his neighbourhood once more. It was rather, I think, that we drifted or wandered into it, but we certainly must have known quite well what we were doing. When we started out in the following spring, with Waka and Kawa in their second year, we were a formidable family, without much cause to be afraid of anything. 
we had no intention of meddling with a grizzly if we happened to meet one and so long as we kept out of the way of thunder sticks there was nothing to hurt us at first we wandered northward with no definite object but as we got nearer a great curiosity came over me to see the places which i had cause to remember so well the berry patch and the house where kawa had met her death and also i believe there was a vague hope of somehow meeting again with my old enemy and being able to square accounts with him he had threatened me again and again and i had always had to run from him moreover i held him responsible in my mind for kawa's death if he had warned us as decent bears always do warn another of any danger when we met him that night on our way to the berry patch we should never have gone on and kawa would not have been captured he was coming away from the patch and he must have known that men were there but for mother's help he would probably have killed father that time when he tried to turn us out of our home altogether it was a long list of injuries that i had against him and i nursed the memory of them perhaps i should meet him some day and this time i should not run away whenever i thought of him i used to get so angry that i would sit up on my hind legs and rub my nose in my chest and growl and woofa knew what was on my mind and growled in sympathy with me so it came about that we travelled steadily northward that summer going back over much of the same ground as father mother and i had travelled when we came away after kawa's death sometimes we stayed in one locality for a week and then perhaps kept moving for a couple of days until we came to another place which tempted us to loiter many times we saw man but he never saw us for we were old and experienced and had no trouble in keeping out of his way we found that he did not always stay wherever he came some houses which i remembered passing three years before we found empty now and in ruins with the roofs falling in and bushes growing over them on several streams the beavers told us that they had not seen a man for three years we now learned too something of the reason of man's coming into the mountains sometimes men's dogs were lost in the woods or they made friends with coyotes and ran wild and they told the coyotes all they knew and from them it spread to the other animals we met one of those coyotes who had been friends with a dog and she told us what the dog had told her it was gold that men were looking for yellow shining stuff that was found in the gravel in the river beds what men wanted with it she had no idea as the dog himself did not know and it was not good to eat but they set great store by it and were always looking for it everywhere following up the streams and scratching and digging in the beds if they found no gold in a stream they left it and went on to another where they did find it they built houses and stayed and more men came and more until towns grew up with roads and horses and cows as we have seen in many ways what the coyote told us agreed with what we had observed for ourselves so we presumed it was true though a coyote is too much like a wolf to be safe to trust as a general rule the next time that we came to a place where the men had been working i thought i would like to see some of the wonderful yellow stuff there were mounds of earth and a long ditch running slantways away from the stream and nobody seemed to be about so i scrambled down into the ditch to look if any of the yellow stuff was there i was walking slowly along sniffing at the ground and the sides of the ditch when suddenly out of a sort of cave in one side and only a few yards from me came a man woofer was just behind me and the cubs behind her 
and he was evidently no less astonished than I, and much more frightened. With one yell he clambered up the bank before I could make up my mind what to do, and rushed to a small tree or sapling nearby, and then for the first time I learned that a man could climb. He went up fast, too, until he got to the first branches, when he stopped and looked down and shouted at us, I suppose with some idea of frightening us. But he had no thunder stick, and we were not in the least afraid, so we followed him and looked at the tree. It was too thin for us to climb, for a bear has to have something solid to take hold of, or I would certainly have gone up after him. As it was, we sat about for a while looking at him, and waiting to see if he would come down again. But he showed no intention of doing that, and, as we did not know how soon other men might come, we left him and went on our way. But I did not go investigating empty ditches in the daylight any more. One thing that completely puzzles us, as completely it terrified, was the thunder stick. What was it? How came man to be able to kill at such distances with it? Above all, at what distance could he kill? These questions puzzled me many a time. It was soon after the adventure in the ditch that for the first time we saw a boat. It was coming down the stream with three men in it. At first we thought the boat itself to be some kind of animal, and that the long oars waving on either side were its legs or wings. But as it came near we saw the men inside and understood what it was. So we stood and watched it. Fortunately, we were out of sight ourselves, or I'm afraid to think what might have happened. Just opposite to us, on the very top of a pine tree on the other bank, an osprey, which had been fishing, was sitting and waiting for the boat to go by. As the boat came alongside us, one of the men, as he sat, raised a thunder stick and pointed it at the osprey, and the bird fell dead, even before, as it seemed to us, the thunderstick had spoken. Until then we had had no idea that the thunderstick could kill up in the air just as well as along the ground. Indeed, we had always agreed among ourselves that, in case we should meet a man with a thunderstick and not have time to get away, we would make for the nearest trees and climb out of his reach. But what was the use of climbing a tree when we had just seen the osprey killed on the top of one much higher than any that we could climb? This incident made man seem more awful than before. We were now within one night's journey of the places that I knew so well, and in a country where men were on all sides. We kept crossing well-worn trails over the mountains, on which we sometimes saw men, and often when we were lying up during the day we heard the noise of mule trains passing, the clangle, clangle, clang of the bell round the neck of the leading mule, and the hoarse voices of the men as they shouted at them. Now also many of the houses were like the one that we had seen by the pool at the beaver dam, with clearings round them in which cows lived, and strange green things were growing. On the evening of the day on which the osprey had been shot, we came to one of these. I remembered the house from three years ago, but other buildings had been added to it, and round it was a wide open space full of stuff that looked like tall waving grass, which I now know was wheat. There was a fence all round it, made of posts with barbed wire stretched between and it was the first time that we had seen barbed wire. Waka, with his inquisitiveness, was the first to find out what barbed wire was. He found out with his nose. When he had stopped grumbling and rubbing his nose on the ground, and could explain what was the matter, I tried it, more cautiously than he had done, but sufficiently to make my nose bleed. We walked nearly all round the field, and everywhere was the horrid wire with its vicious spikes. But we wanted to get into the field, because we were sure that the long, waving, yellowing wheat 
would be good to eat. At last an idea occurred to Woofa, who took the top of one of the posts in her two paws, and, throwing her whole weight back, wrenched it clean out of the ground. Still the wire held across, and I had to treat the next post in the same way, and then the next. Both she and I left tufts of our hair on the sharp points, but the wire was now lying on the ground where we could step over it, so we waded shoulder high into the wheat, and before we left the field it was grey dawn, and we had, each of us, I think, eaten more than we had eaten before in all our lives. We had trampled all over the field, munching and munching and munching at the wheat ears, which were full and sweet and just beginning to ripen. Then we went down to the stream for a drink, and by the time the sun was up, we were three or four miles away in the mountains. The children pleaded to be allowed to go there again the next night, but that was a point which we had settled that evening when we had caught the pig. Never again would we go back to a place where we had taken anything of man's which he could miss, and where he might be prepared for a second visit. So we went cautiously onward the next evening with the signs of man's presence always around us. Almost half the trees had been chopped down. There were trails over the mountains in all directions, and houses everywhere by the streams, from which men's voices came to us until late at night. Silently, in single file, we threaded our way, I leading, and Woofer bringing up the rear. Bears that had not our experience would certainly have got into trouble, but I knew man, and was not terrified at his smell or the sound of his voice, and knew, too, that all that was needed was to keep out of his sight and move quietly. Mile by mile we pushed on without mishap, but there were so many men, and things had changed so much, that, remembering the visit to my first home, I doubted whether I should be able to recognise the berry patch when I came to it, when suddenly there it was in front of me. The trees all round it had been cut down, so that it came into view sooner than I had expected, but when I looked upon it I saw that it had hardly changed. The moon was high overhead, and the patch glistened in the light as of old. Across the middle ran a hard brown roadway, which was not there in the old days, but otherwise all was the same. I was standing almost on the spot from which I had watched Kawa being dragged away, and the scene was nearly as distinct to me as it had been at the time. We did not go down into the patch. The trees around the edges had been so much thinned out that it was less easy to approach in safety. So we contented ourselves with wandering round and eating such fruit as remained on the scattered bushes which grew among the trees on the outskirts of the wood. It was already after midnight, and we only stayed for an hour or so, and then I led the way back into the hills, intending to go and see if our old lair, for which my father and mother had had to fight in the former days, was still untouched by man, and would afford us safe shelter for the coming day. As I did so, my thoughts went back to that morning, and I growled to myself, for I was thinking of my old enemy, and wondering whether I should ever have the opportunity of avenging the old injuries. And lo, even as I was wondering, the opportunity came. Waka had strayed from the path, and suddenly I heard him growling, and a moment later he came running to my side, and out of the brush behind him loomed the figure of another bear. I knew him in a moment, and it was characteristic of him that he should have attacked a cub like Waka, not, of course, knowing that it was the grandchild of the pair whom he had tried to dispossess of their home so long before. As he saw the rest of us, he stopped in his pursuit of Waka, and stood up on his hind legs, growling angrily, and as I measured him with my eyes, 
I realized how much bigger I must be than my father, for this bear, who had towered over my father, was not an inch taller or an ounce heavier than I. We were as nearly matched as two bears could be, but I had no doubt of my ability to punish him, for I had right on my side, and I had waited a long time for this moment, and would fight as one fights who is filled with rage at old wrongs that are left to him to redress. And I did not leave him long in any doubt as to my intentions, but walked straight towards him, telling him as I did so that I had been looking for him, and that the time had come for the settling of old scores. He understood who I was, and was just as ready to fight as I. I am not going to trouble you with an account of another fight. I pursued my old plan, and he had been so used to have other bears make way for him and fight only under compulsion, that I think my first rush surprised him so much that it gave me even more advantage than usual. Big and strong as he was, the issue was never in doubt from the start, for I felt within myself that my fury made me irresistible, and from the moment that I threw myself on him, he never had time to breathe or take the initiative. He was beaten in a few minutes, and he knew it, but he fought desperately, and with a savageness that told me that if he had won, he would have been satisfied with nothing less than my life. But he was not to win, and, whimpering, growling, bleeding, and mad with shame and rage, I drove him back, and it was only a question of how far I chose to push my victory. I let him live, but he went away torn and crippled, with his spirit broken and his fighting days over. Never again would he stand to face a full-grown bear. For years he had made everything that he met move aside from his path in the forest, and he had used his strength always for evil, to domineer and to crush and to tyrannize. Thenceforward he would know what it was to be made to stand aside for others, to yield the right of way, and to whine and fawn on his fellows. For a bear once broken in body and spirit, as I broke him, is broken for good. I was not hurt beyond a few flesh wounds, which Woofer licked for me before we slept, and it was with a curious sense of satisfaction and completeness, as if the chief work of my life were now well done, that I lay down in the old lair, which had so many associations for me, with my wife and well-grown children by me, and rested through the heat of the following day. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Life Story of a Black Bear this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Life Story of a Black Bear by Harry Perry Robinson. Chapter 13. The Trap. The old neighbourhood was no place for us to stay in, however satisfactory our brief visit to it had been. It was man's country now, and there were no other bears in the vicinity. My enemy of the night before, being old and cunning and solitary, had managed to live there unscathed year after year, after the other bears had all gone away or been killed. But for us, a family of four of whom two were inexperienced youngsters not yet two years old, it was different. Many times during the day men passed not far from us, and the distant sounds of their voices and the chopping of axes was in our ears all day. So we remained under cover till well into the night when man's eyes are useless, and then we started out silently and, as our custom was when moving through dangerous country, in single file, with the cubs between Woofer and myself. 
The end of that summer was very hot, and partly for the coolness, and partly also to get as far away from man as possible, we went northward and up into higher ranges of the mountains than we usually cared to visit. As we climbed upwards, the trees grew smaller and further apart, until, just below the extreme top, they ceased altogether. Above the tree line rose what looked from below like the ordinary rounded summit of a mountain with rocky sides, and even at this time of year small patches of snow still lingered on the sheltered spots. As we came out on the top, however, instead of the rounded summit which we expected, the ground broke suddenly away before our feet, and below us, blue and still and circular, lay a lake. The mountain was no more than a shell or a gigantic cup, filled to within fifty feet of its rocky brim with the clearest of water. I had seen a similar lake in the year when I roamed alone before I met Woofa, and my father had told me long ago that there were many of these mountain lakes round us, though of course we could not see them from below. Here on these lonely summits live the mountain sheep, and mountain goat. Round the edge of the water their feet had beaten a regular trail, and in the rough crevices of the bark of the last of the trees, tufts of white wool were sticking where the goats had rubbed themselves against the trunks. As we stood on the edge of the thin lip of rock, a sheep with its great curved horns that had been drinking at the lake scrambled up in alarm up the further side and standing there for a minute against the skyline opposite, disappeared over the edge. And though we lived there for nearly two months, and smelled them often, and heard them every night, we never saw one again except clear across the whole width of the lake. They were probably right in keeping away from us, because a young mountain sheep, well, though I had never tasted one, it somehow suggested thoughts of pig. At one side there was a break in the rocky wall or rim of the cup, and through this the water trickled to swell gradually as it went on down the mountain into a stream, which, joining with the other streams, somewhere became, no doubt, a river. At the point where the water flowed out of the lake, the hillside was strewn with huge boulders and fragments of rock down to below the timber line, and here among these rocks, where the brush grew over them and the stream tumbled by, was an ideal place to spend the remaining hot weather, and here we stayed. Man, we were sure, had never been here, nor was he likely to come, and we wandered carelessly and without a shadow of fear. Before the cold weather came, our family broke up, we did not quarrel, but it is in the course of nature that young bears, when they are able to take care of themselves, should go out into the world. Waka was no longer a cub, and there is not room in one family for two full-grown he-bears. On the other hand, Woofa and Kawa had not of late got on well together. My wife, as is the way of women, was a little jealous of my affection for Kawa, and, well, sometimes I'm bound to say that I thought Woofa spent rather too much time with Waka and forgot my existence. So on all accounts it was better that we should separate. I had been driven away by my father when I was a year younger than Waka was now, but I do not blame him. For the disappearance of Kawa, the first Kawa, and living away from home, and nightly wanderings in the town, had made a breach between us. Now, at the separation from my son, there was no bad feeling, and one day, by common consent, he and Kawa went away not to return. I had no apprehension that they would not be able to take care of themselves, and as for me, Woofa was company enough, and we were both glad to have each other all to ourselves again. Soon after the children had gone, the chill in the wind gave warning that winter was not far away, and we began to move down towards the lower levels, 
for on the mountain tops it is too exposed and cold, and the snow stays too long to make them a good winter home. As we looked up a few days later to the peak which we had left, we saw it standing out against the dull sky, not yellow-grey and rocky as we had left it, but all gleaming white and snow-covered. For a day or two more we followed the streams down to the lower country, and then made our dens beneath the roots of two upturned trees close together, and again, as two years before, Woofer spent much time and great care over the lining of hers, making it very snug and soft and warm. And next spring there were two more little ones, another woolly brown waka and another kawa, just as woolly and just as brown, to look after and teach and protect from porcupines and pumas and wolves and make fit for the struggle of life. I am not going to attempt to tell you any stories of the early days of the new cubs, for the events of a bear's babyhood are always much alike, and it is not easy looking back to distinguish one's later children from one's first. And I should probably only tell you over again stories of the waka and kawa of two years before. They were healthy, vigorous cubs, the new little ones, and they tumbled and played and were smacked and blundered their way along somehow. But it was a terrible year, with late snows long after spring ought to have begun, and then it rained and rained all the summer. There was no berry crop. Insects of all kinds had been killed by the late cold and were very scarce. Every stream stayed in flood, so that the fish never came up properly and there was none of the usual hunting along the exposed herbage as the streams went down in the summer heat. It was, as I said, a terrible year, and food was hard to get for a whole family. We were driven to all sorts of shifts, and then, to make matters worse, long before the usual time for winter came, bitter frosts set in. Driven by hunger and the necessity of finding food for the little ones, we did what we had thought never to do again, and once more we went down to the neighbourhood of man. We were not the only ones that did so, for the animals were nearly all driven out of the mountains, and the bears especially congregated about the settlements of man in search of food. Wherever we went, we found the same thing, the bears coming out at night to hunt round the houses for food, and many stories we heard of their being shot when greedily eating meat that had been placed out for them, or when sniffing round a horse, or trying to take a pig. Now, too, man brought a new weapon beside his thunder stick. Huge traps with steel jaws that were baited with meat and covered with sticks and twigs and earth, so that a bear could not see them, but when he went to take the meat, the great toothed jaws closed round his leg, and then he found that the trap was chained to a neighbouring log which he had to drag round with him till the men came out and killed him with their thunder sticks. Having been told all about it, when we came one day to a large piece of a young pig lying on the ground, I made the others stand away while I scratched cautiously round and pushed sticks against the pig, carefully keeping my own paws out of the way. Even as it was, when the steel jaws came together with a snap that made the whole trap leap into the air as if it was alive, they passed so near my nose that I shudder now when I think of it. But we ate the pig, and that happened two or three times until the men took the trap away from that particular place. Another time I had a narrow escape on approaching a house at night. We had been there several times, and usually picked up some scraps of stuff that was good. I always went down first alone to see if all was safe, leaving the others in the shelter of the woods, and on this occasion I was creeping stealthily up to the house, when, suddenly, from behind a pile of chopped wood, 
A thunder stick spoke, and I felt a sudden pain in my shoulder. I was only grazed, however, and scrambled back to Woofer and the cubs in safety. But we did not visit that house any more, and I heard that a few days after, another bear that went down, just as I had gone, was killed by a thunder stick from behind the same pile of wood. In the long run, however, a bear is no match for man. It was a dangerous life that we were living, and we knew it. But both Woofer and I had had more than ordinary experience of man, and we believed we could always escape him. Besides, what else were we to do? It is doubtful if we could have lived in the mountains that winter, and we had our cubs to look after. In the old days before man came, when, as once in many years, the weather drove us from the mountains, we could have gone down to the foothills and the plains and found food there, but man now barred our way, and the only thing that we could do was to go where he was and live on such food as we could get. Much of that food was only what was thrown away, but much of it also we deliberately stole. More than one cornfield we visited, and in the fenced enclosures round his houses we found strange vegetables that were good to eat, but we had to break down fences to get them. We stole pigs, too, and twice when dogs attacked us we had to kill the dogs. Once we found half a sheep, which had been killed by man, lying on the ground as if man had forgotten it. We ate it, and were all dreadfully ill afterwards. Then we knew that it had been poisoned and put out for us. But fortunately, the poison was not enough to kill four of us, though I suppose if any one of us had eaten the whole, that one would have died. After that, we never touched large pieces of meat which were found lying about. It was, as I have said, a dangerous life, and we knew it, but we were driven to it, and we trusted our experience, our cunning, and our strength to pull us through somehow. Winter came, and we ought to have gone to our dens, but we were not fit for it. We were too poorly fed and thin, and hunger would probably have driven us out in midwinter. It was better to stay out now, so we stayed, keeping for the most part in the immediate neighbourhood of a number of men's houses along a certain stream. It was not a town, though there was one a few miles further down the stream, but for a distance of a mile or more on both sides of the water there were houses every hundred yards or so, and all day long men were at work digging and working in the ground along by the water looking for gold. We had kept all other bears away from the place, and, living in the mountains during the day, we used to come down at night, never going near the same house on two nights in succession, but being sometimes on one side of the stream, which was easily crossed, and sometimes on the other, and paying our visits wherever we thought we were least likely to be expected. Some nights we would not go near the houses at all, but would content ourselves with such food as we could find in the woods, though now in the bitter cold it was hard to find anything. Early one morning, after one of these nights when we had kept away from the houses, we came across a trap. It evidently was a trap, because there was the bait put out temptingly in plain sight, not on the ground this time, but about a foot from the ground, tied to a stick. The curious thing about it was, however, that the whole affair was inside some sort of a house, or, rather, there were the three walls and roof of a small house, but there was no front to it. That was all open, and there, well inside, was the bait. I did not know why men had been at so much pains to build the house round the trap, but I had no doubt that if I approached the bait with proper caution and scratched at it, the steel jaws would spring out as usual from somewhere, and then we could eat the meat. 
and we were all four distressingly hungry. So I told the others to stay behind while I went into the house and sprung the trap, and brought the meat out to them. I went in, and began to scratch about on the ground where I supposed the usual trap to be, but there was nothing there but the hard, dry earth. This puzzled me, but the lump of meat tied to the stake was an obvious fact, and I was hungry. At last, since, scratch as I would, no steel jaws appeared from anywhere, nor was there any place where they could be concealed, nothing remained but to take the meat boldly. I reached for it with my paw, but it was firmly tied, so I took it in my mouth and pulled. As I did so, I heard a sudden movement behind me. A log had fallen behind me, almost blocking up the door. Well, I would move that out of the way when I had the meat, I thought, and, seizing it firmly in my mouth, I tore it from its fastenings and turned to take it to the others waiting outside. But the log across the door was bigger than I thought, it completely blocked my passage, and when I gave a push, it did not yield. Still, I had no uneasiness. I pushed harder at the log, but it did not move. I tried to pull it inward, but it remained unshaken. I sniffed all along it and around it and round the other walls of the small house, and was puzzled as to what to do next. So I called to Woofa, who came outside and began sniffing round too. Remembering how I had released Kawa from her pen, I told Woofa to lift the latch. But there was no latch, she said. This was growing tiresome, and then, all of a sudden, it dawned on me. This was the trap, this room. There was no steel thing with jaws, no poisoned meat, nothing but this house, which itself was the trap left open at one side so that I might walk in, and so arranged that as I pulled at the meat, the heavy log dropped, shutting the open door, and dropped in such a way that the strength of ten bears would not move it. This was the trap, and I, I was caught. That I was really, hopelessly, and finally caught, I could not, of course, believe at first. There was some mistake, some way out of it. I had outwitted man so often that it was not to be thought of that he had won at last. And round and round the small space I went again and again, always coming back to the cracks above the fallen log to scratch and strain at them without the smallest result. Outside, Woofer was doing the same. I was inclined to lose my temper with her at first, believing that if I was outside in her place, I could surely find some way of making an opening, but I saw that she was trying as hard to let me out as I was trying to get out myself. And then I heard the cubs beginning to whimper, as they comprehended vaguely what had happened, and saw their mother's fruitless efforts and her evident distress. Then I began to rage. I remember taking the meat in my mouth and, without eating a morsel, rending it into small bits. I found the stick to which it had been tied, and broke it with my jaws into a hundred pieces. I attacked the walls and the door furiously, beating them with my paws, blow after blow, that would have broken a bear's neck, and tearing at the logs with my teeth till my gums were cut so that my mouth ran blood and outside as they heard me raging within, not the cubs only, but Woofa also whimpered and tore the ground with teeth and claws. We might as well have stormed at the sky or the mountains. The house stood none the worse, and I was as far from freedom as ever. By this time, the night had passed and dawn had come. I could smell it, and see through the chinks that the air was lightening outside. And then outside I heard a new sound, a sound that filled me with rage and fear, the barking of a dog. 
nearer it came and nearer and i heard the voice of a man calling but the dog was much nearer than the man evidently running ahead of him and evidently also coming straight for the trap in another minute the dog had caught sight of the bears outside for i heard the snarling rush of an angry dog and with it waka growling as the dog attacked him the shouting of a man's voice grew nearer and then mingled with the noise of the fight between waka and the dog i heard the angry woofing of woofer's voice the dog's voice changed as it turned to attack this more formidable enemy but suddenly its barking ended in a yelp followed by another and another which slowly faded away into what i knew were its death cries what could any dog expect who dared to face such a bear as woofer fighting for her children but the last of the dog's death cries were drowned by the most awful of all sounds the voice of the thunderstick and my heart leapt as i heard waka cry out in what i knew was mortal agony then came woofer's voice again and in such tones that i pitied anyone who stood before her again the thunderstick spoke and i heard what i knew was woofer charging i heard her growling in her throat in what was almost a roar and the crashing of bushes and the shouts of the man's voice and more crashing of bushes which died away in the distance down the hillside then all was silent except where somewhere in the rear of the house little kawa whimpered miserably to herself all this i heard and most of it i understood standing motionless and helpless inside the trap powerless to help my wife and children when in such desperate straits within a few yards of me as the silence fell and the tension was relaxed i fell to raging again with a fury tenfold greater than before tearing and beating at the walls rending great lumps of fur out of myself with my claws biting my paws till the blood ran and filling the air with my cries of helpless anger at last through the noise that i was making i heard woofer's voice she had returned and was speaking to me from outside brokenly for she was out of breath and in pain she told me the story waka was dead and the dog the latter she had killed with her paw the former had been slain by the first stroke of the thunderstick then she had charged at the man who however was a long way off the thunderstick had spoken again and had broken her leg as she fell the man had turned to run she had followed but he had a start and with her broken leg she could not have caught him without chasing him right up to his house but he had thrown the thunderstick away as he ran and that she had found and chewed into small pieces before returning to me and now her leg was utterly useless here was kawa a helpless cub what was she to do there was only one thing for her to do to make good her own escape with kawa if possible but how about me she asked i must remain there was no alternative and she could do no good by staying with her broken leg she could not help me against the men who would undoubtedly return in force and she would only be sacrificing kawa's life and her own she must go and at once she knew in her heart that it was the only thing and very reluctantly for kawa's sake she consented there was no time for long farewells and there was no need of them for we knew that we loved each other and whatever came each knew that the other would carry himself or herself staunchly as a bear should so she went and i heard her stumbling along with her broken leg and kawa whining as she trotted by her mother's side 
I knew that, even if they escaped with their lives, I should in all probability never hear of it. I listened till the last sound had died away, and it was so still outside that it seemed as if everything in the forest must be dead. My rage had passed away, and in its place was an unspeakable loneliness and despair, and I sat myself up in the furthest corner of the narrow house, with my back against the wall and my face to the door, and with my muzzle buried in my chest, awaited the return of the enemy. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Life Story of a Black Bear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Life Story of a Black Bear by Harry Perry Robinson. Chapter 14. In the Hands of Man. It seemed to me that I waited a long time, but it cannot have been really long, for it was not yet noon when I heard again the barking of dogs and the voices of men approaching. They walked round and round the trap and tried to peer through the crevices, and they let off their thundersticks, presumably to make me give some sign that I was inside, but I remained crouching in the corner, silent. Then I heard them on the roof. A sudden ray of light pierced the half-darkness, and in another moment one of the logs from the roof had been lifted off and thrown upon the ground outside, and the sunlight poured in upon me. I heard a shout from one of the men, and, looking up out of the corners of my eyes, I saw their heads appearing in the opening above, one behind the other, but I did not move, nor give any sign that I was alive. The next thing I knew was that a rope dropped on me from above. It had a loop at the end which fell across my head, and, remembering Kawa, and how she had been dragged away with ropes about her, I raised a paw and pushed the thing aside. Somehow, as I did so, the loop fell over my paw, and when I tried to shake it off, it slipped and ran tight about my wrist, and the men at the other end jerked it till it cut deep into the flesh. Then I lost my temper, and when a second rope fell on me, I struck at it angrily with my free paw, but only with the same result. Both my paws were now fast, the two ropes passing out through the roof, one at one side and one at the other, and as the men pulled and jerked on them inch by inch, in spite of all my strength, my arms were gradually stretched out full spread on either side of me, and I was helpless, held up on my hind legs, unable to drop my forefeet to the floor, and unable to reach the rope on either side with my teeth. Then I lost all control of myself, and I remember nothing of the struggle that followed except that everything swam red around me, and I raged blindly, furiously, impotently. In the end, another rope was fast to one of my hind legs, and another round my neck. Then, I know not how, they lifted the log, which Woofer and I had been unable to budge, away from the door, and, fighting desperately, I was dragged out into the open, and so, yard by yard, down, down the mountain towards their houses. I was utterly helpless. Four of the men walked, two on either side of me, each having hold of the end of a rope, and all the ropes were kept taut. If I stopped, the two dogs that they had with them fell upon my heels and bit, and I could not turn or use a paw to reach them. If I tried to charge at the men on either side, my feet were jerked from under me, before I could move a yard, and somewhere close behind me all the while, I knew, walked the last man with a thunder stick in his hand, which might speak at any minute. It was nearly evening by the time that they had dragged me the mile or so to where their houses were. As we came near, other men joined us until there must have been thirty or more, but the original four still held the ropes, and they dragged me into one of the buildings 
several times larger than the trap, and, making holes in the walls between the logs, they passed the ends of the ropes through them and made them fast outside, so that I was still held in the same position with my two arms stretched out on either side of me and the ropes cutting into the flesh. So they left me. They left me for two days and two nights. Often they came in and looked at me and spoke to me, and once the ropes were slackened for a minute or two from the sides, and a large pail of water was pushed within my reach. I think they saw that I was going mad from thirst, as certainly I was. I plunged my face into the water and drank, and as soon as I ceased, the ropes were pulled tight and the pail was taken away. It was not until the third day that I had a mouthful to eat. When the same thing was repeated, the ropes were slackened for a while, and both food and drink were pushed up to me. I was allowed a longer time to make the meal, but as soon as I had finished, the ropes were tightened once more. Two days later, I was given another meal, and then two days and another, but I was never given as much food as I wanted, but only enough to keep me alive. By this time, I had come to distinguish the men apart, and one, I saw, was the master of the others. He it was who always brought me my food, and, I am ashamed to confess it, I began to look forward to his coming. Kill him? Yes, gladly would I have killed him, had he put himself within my reach. But I saw that he meant me no harm. The tone of his voice when he spoke to me was not angry. When he spoke, he called me Peter. And I came to understand that this was the name he had given me. When he came to the door and said Peter, I knew that food was coming. I hated him thoroughly, but it seemed that he was all that stood between me and starvation, and however much he made me suffer, I understood that he did not intend to kill me or wish to let me die. Then I remembered what Kawa had said about the man who gave her food and used to play with her, and I began to comprehend it. No one ever attempted to play with me or dared to put themselves within the reach of my paws, but after a while, this man, the man whom I in my turn now thought of as Peter, when my paws were safely bound and the ropes taut, would come to me and lay his hand upon my head, taking care to keep well out of the reach of my teeth. He rarely came to see me at any time of the day or night without bringing me lumps of sugar, which he held out to my mouth on the end of a piece of board so that I could lick them off, and after a while he gave me meals every day, and I was less hungry. Then, one day, another rope was slipped over my nose, so that I could not bite, and, while all the ropes were stretched to their uttermost, and I could not move an inch, Peter put a heavy collar around my neck, to which was fastened a chain that I could neither break nor gnaw and when that had been firmly fastened around one of the logs in the wall, the ropes were all taken off. Whoa! Oh, the relief of it! Both my wrists and one of my ankles where the ropes had been were cut almost to the bone, and horribly painful, but though it was at first excruciating agony to rest my weight on my front feet, the delight of being able to get on all fours again and to be able to move around to the full length of the chain was inexpressible. I had not counted the days, but it must have been over a month since I was captured, and all the time I had been bound, so that, sleeping or waking, I was always in the same position, sitting on my haunches, with the ropes always pulling at my outstretched arms. For another month and more, I was kept in the same building, always chained and with the collar round my neck, until one day they tried to put the ropes on me again. But I was cunning now, and I would not let them do it. I simply lay down, keeping my nose and paws in the earth, and as long as a rope was anywhere near me, refused to move either for food or drink. But a bear is no match for men. 
they appeared to give up all attempts to put ropes on me, until, a few days later, they brought a lump of wool on the end of a long stick and pushed it into my face till I bit at it and worried it. It was soaked in something, the smell of which choked me and made me dizzy, and when I could hardly see, somehow they slipped a sack over my head that reeked with the same smell, and the next thing I knew was that I must have been asleep for an hour or more, and the ropes were on all my legs again. When they began to drag me out of the building, I resisted at first, but I soon knew it was useless, so I made up my mind to go quietly, and they took me away, down the stream and over the mountains for several days and nights, until one evening we came to a town, and they dragged me into a box nearly as big as a house, and bigger than the trap in which I had been caught. And soon the box began to move. I know now that I was on the railway. We travelled for days and days out of the mountains into the plains, where, for three days, there were no trees or hills, but only the great stretch of flat yellow land. I had no idea that there was so much of the world. From the railway I was put on a boat, and from the boat back onto the railway, and from that back on a boat again. For nearly a month we were constantly moving, always as far as I could tell, in the same direction, and yet we never came to the end of the world. During this time Peter was always with me, or close at hand. He gave me all my meals, and when other men took the ropes to lead me from the railway to the boat or back again, if I got angry, he spoke to me, and for some reason, though I hardly know why myself, it calmed me. It was not until I had been in the gardens here, in this same cage, for some days, that at last he went away and never came back. That was two years ago. When he went away, the new Peter took charge of me, and he has been here ever since. Two years. It is a long time to be shut up in a cage, but I mind it less than I did at first. Why does man do it? I do not understand, nor can I guess what I am wanted for. I stay here in the cage all the time, and Peter brings me meals and cleans the cage, one half at a time, when I am shut up in the other half. And crowds of people come and walk past day after day and look at me, and give me all sorts of things to eat, some quite ridiculous things, like paper bags and walnut shells and pocket handkerchiefs. Peter, I believe, means to be kind to me always, and I think he is proud of me, from the way he brings people to look at me. But how could you expect me to be friendly to man after all I have suffered at his hands? Even Peter, as I have said, never comes into the same half of the cage with me. I have often wondered what I would do if he did. Twice only have men come within my reach when my paws have been free, and neither of them will ever go near a bear again. But I am not sure whether I would hurt Peter or not. I like him to scratch my head through the bars. Twice since I have been here, they have given me a she-bear as a companion, and she has tried to make friends with me, but they had to take her away again. Let them bring me woofer if they think I'm lonely. And... I am lonely at times, in spring and summer especially, when it is hot and dusty, and I remember how Woofer and I used to have the cool forests to wander in at nights, and the thick, moist shade of the brush by the water's edge to lie in during the day. Then I get sick for the scent of the pines, and the touch of the wet bushes, and the feel of the good, soft earth under my claws. And sometimes, in the heat of the day, I hear the scream of an eagle from somewhere round there to the right. It is in a cage, I suppose, like myself, 
for it calls always from the same place, and I never hear a mate answering. And it all comes back to me. The winding streams, and the beaver dams, with the kingfishers, black and white, darting over the water, and the osprey sitting and screaming from its post on the pine top. And at night, sometimes, when the wolves howl, and the deer whistle, or the whine of a puma reaches my ears, all caged, I suppose. The longing for the old life becomes almost intolerable. I yearn for the long mountain slopes, with the cool night wind blowing, and the stately rows of trees, black-stemmed and silver-topped in the moonlight, and the noise of the tumbling streams in one's ears, when all the world was mine to wander in. Mine and woofers. Yes, I want freedom, but I want woofer most, and I do not even know, and never shall know now, whether she and Kawa escaped with their lives that day, when I could not get to her even to lick the blood from her broken leg. But, on the other hand, these thoughts only come when some external sight or sound arouses them in me and at ordinary times I am content. I have enough to eat, which, after all, is the main thing in life, and am saved the work of finding food for myself. I never know real hunger now, as sometimes I knew it in the old days, when the frost was on the ground, and there is no need now to hibernate. My first winter here I started as a matter of habit, and scratched the sawdust and stuff into a heap in that corner over there. But what was the use, when it never got cold, and my meals came every day? My claws are growing horribly long from lack of use, because there is nothing here to dig for, and I know I'm getting fat from want of exercise. But... It is pleasant enough lying and dreaming of the old days. And after all, perhaps I have lived my life. There is nothing that I look back upon with shame. It was not my fault that my sister Kawa died, for I did my best to save her. Even if the later little Kawa perished, still... I sent one son and a daughter out into the world, fit, I think, to hold their own. Above all, I avenged the old insult to my parents. What more could I have done had I had my freedom longer? It is all good to remember, and, except when I long for woofer, I am content. End of chapter 14. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. End of The Life Story of a Black Bear by Harry Perry Robinson.